the democratization of China. This is both an empirical puzzle, because for the West it was assumed that China had the per capita income and the low levels of corruption and institutional strength to transition over to a democracy. And it was not expected that a middle class with the levels of education that the Chinese do would continue to support an autocratic regime. It's also a question of strategy. The West's strategy, to the extent that there was a strategy, was to engage China commercially so that it would grow in wealth, create a middle class, and then become a democracy as the surest way to peace. In reality, that strategy was compromised by business interests, human rights interests, and immigration. So when will China become a democracy? I believe China's democratization is inevitable. It is unavoidable. And when it happens, it'll happen very quickly. But so far, predictions of democratization have failed, as well as the early steps. Modernization theory predicts that states will democratize as they modernize. Once a state's citizens per capita passes 6,000, any democratic transition is irreversible. So once a country is democratic at that level, regardless of anything except invasion by a foreign power, the state will not lose its democracy. It will not revert to authoritarianism. The IMF reports that China's nominal GDP has passed 6000 and it stands at US $12,000 per year in 2023. So if China were to democratize, that democratization would be irreversible. However, China has not undergone a democratic transition and does not look like it's about to. Late developing states, economically, have been more able to delay democratization than their European equivalents, which were less able to resist capitalist bourgeois pressure and then the class mobilization of manufacturing labor. Karl Deutsch argued that economic development facilitates social mobilization, but this can be deflected from democratization if it results in a significant change of class identity. Specifically, modernization will not result in democratization in the short term if the working classes are converted into the middle class. As well, when you have a population that depends on public pensions, and not on private enterprise, they're far more likely to protect the state, which is the source of those pensions, even when the pensions come through state-owned enterprises. You can see in the uh, uh, pictures there, um, Wang Dang in the Tiananmen Square uprising of uh, June 4th, 1989. Here you can see China's dramatic rise in per capita income. So it might not simply be the level of the per capita income as much as how long the citizens have had that so that they lose the memory of gratefulness for the authoritarian government that brought about the economic uh, change. So we can compare China's per capita income to the per capita income of other countries. Taiwan, for example, transitioned in 1996 and at 20,000 per capita income, it became uh, irreversible democracy quite late. But there are a number of variables that could bring into question China's democratization and affect the initial regime transition. The first is the question of whether or not the democracy was imposed. For countries like Iraq, which had a democracy imposed a few years after the uh, 2003 uh, US invasion, that democracy may be very fragile and essentially surviving on funding from abroad. There could be a question of violence. Did the population have to sacrifice to create the new government and therefore what was the stake of the population in creating the new government. 
Was there a prior period of democracy? In the case of China, there was not. For many countries in the Warsaw Pact, especially Czechoslovakia, they were democracies before. So the transition actually took hours and then days to organize an election. Countries which have multiple identities, and so there are hierarchies, may lead one identity group to delay democratization so they can maintain their power. This was the situation with the Republic of South Africa when it had an apartheid regime before 1993. Uh, there could also be issues when the country is a primary resource exporter and an elite acting like rent-seeking controllers of that single resource use it to essentially subsidize the population's lifestyle, in effect bribing them so that there is no regime transition. And we can see this in Saudi Arabia and other Persian Gulf states. The country might be facing a terrestrial threat requiring a greater role of the military in governance. And so this could also delay democratization or introduce various non-democratic ele elements to the state's governance. This would be France in the 19th and early 20th century. And a country might be more susceptible to democratization if there's a demonstration effect by an adjacent state, especially if that adjacent state is culturally similar. In that sense, Taiwan poses a institutional threat to China because it's a demonstration of a functioning liberal democracy. So the People's Republic of China, through the efforts of the Communist Party of China, shows evidence of authoritarian durability. The durability is grounded in four factors. One, Confucian cultural inconsistency with liberal democracy. Two, the Communist Party's control of the civil police and the army. Three, the large pool of conservative and supportive rural Chinese, who are providing the recruits for the military and the police. Four, the middle class's dependence on the state for security protection from migrant workers and in the outlying provinces from hostile indigenous populations. The Communist Party may also be enhancing its institutional resilience through four factors. One, rule-bound procedures for succession and governance. Two, meritocratic rather than factional criteria for promotion. Three, specialization of the regime's institutions, particularly the state institutions, not the party institutions. And four, the creation of venues for the grievances of citizens. Now, we've seen, starting with the second term of Xi Jinping, that a great many of these reforms have been rolled back, particularly the first and the second. While Xi Jinping has engaged in anti-graft investigations, basically anti-corruption, the rules that make the regime look legitimate and responsive and in contact with the population have been rolled away. There are other factors. The CCP may be buttressed by the public's memory of the failure and resulting chaos of the democratic transition following the 1911 revolution, the overthrow of the Qing dynasty, which resulted eventually in warlordism and weakness in the 1920s, and then invasion in 1931 and again in 1937 by Japan. The Qing dynasty had also attempted democratic reforms unsuccessfully in the 1902-1908 period after the Boxer Rebellion. Chinese demonstrators supporting the 1911 revolution, and you can see here them demonstrating in May of 1919, uh, they were also demonstrating against the Versailles Treaty that was being negotiated in Europe, the Paris Treaty, which was meant to bring justice to world governance, uh, but in which many countries were locked out and China was not able to redress the grievance of the territorial uh, um, seizures by Japan and European states. And we can also see the lead up to the June 4th incident. Both of the May 1919 and the June 4th incident called for a strengthened China as one of their principal goals. So the goal was not only liberal, it was also nationalistic in both cases. There's also, therefore, some suspicion that democratization is a U.S. instrument to weaken China's ability to maintain its security. 
The trigger for democratization is typically some level of discontent, typically a crisis of economic mismanagement, such as high inflation or unemployment, which the Beijing government has thus far avoided. Inflation may occur as public demands for services increase and the government's shortage of resources compels it to deficit spend. The probability that a regime will collapse is twice as high during an economic decline as opposed to an increase in growth rates. However, high growth rates may trigger discontent based on relative expectations, as was the case during and in the lead up to the June 4th, 1989 incident, the Tiananmen Square massacre. Here uh, you can see some of the demonstrators in that period. Now there are a number of issues in China that may trigger discontent. One of these is surplus labor resulting from pro progressive de collectivization, a rise in urban unemployment due to the failure of state-owned enterprises or a slowdown in export-oriented manufacturing, increased fiscal burden on farmers, privatization of healthcare and education, and state-level corruption. State-owned enterprises constituted in 2010 30% of the Chinese economy. It was 70% in 1999, 50% in 2008. In 2011, there were 67 million workers in the SOEs, 22 million in foreign firms, and 69 million employed in private enterprises, and 52 million that were self-employed for a total of 210 million. So out of a total labor force of 937 million, 357 million were working in uh, uh, urban concerns. State-owned enterprises in 2020 account for 40% of China's GDP. This is important because they, it was thought that these state-owned enterprises would completely disappear by 2020, but in fact, they've kept a constant proportion of the overall economy. They produce the heavy equipment like uh, ships and trucks and uh, uh, trains, and the government has maintained control over these strategic industries while allowing the private sector to uh, become involved in exports and cyber commerce. Now, China's middle class has risen from 3% in 2000 to 28% in 2022. About half of the urban population makes a per capita income of around 34,000 US, which is significant. It's about 40% of the US income. Now, the communist governments have been fairly responsible thus far, anticipating many of the public demands, such as closing down envir environmentally damaging industries in anticipation of local demands. Although most people in China live in a, a form of a, a condo or an apartment, these are owned rather than uh, rented. 80% of Chinese households are property owners, as compared with the US, which is about 65%. This doesn't indicate necessarily wealth. There are different styles of ownership. In Europe, there's a lot more renting, uh, in, particularly in countries like uh, Belgium. Another source of discontent could emerge out of the regime's intolerant response to a mass mobilization or political dissent. While environmental complaints may not be a direct lead into democratization, the state's unmeasured response to a public demonstration against an environmental issue may be a catalyst. Increasingly salient cases of public corruption and lack of legal transparency may reduce public confidence in the authoritarian regime even during periods of high growth. There are thousands of cases of protests and rightful resistance in China, although they are overwhelmingly about local and specific issues. Although the frequency uh, that these have occurred since Xi Jinping's uh, second term uh, has, in 2017, uh, these have decreased significantly. You can see in the bottom right corner a survey which showed surprisingly a reluctance in China to move ahead with democratization. So you could see that 10% think that democratization is a, a Western plot. Um, you've got uh, some that think it's naive or unrealistic. Uh, 
and there's only 15% of Chinese that are in favor. Now what you see in the top right corner is a picture of elections that were conducted in a village in Guangdong following a corruption case over a local municipality and a young woman organized an election against that party and they won. And then in 2012 when Xi Jinping took over he cancelled the election results and there were demonstrations and if you go on YouTube you can see scenes of riot police as the villagers rose up and most of the uh, key members including the young woman were arrested and that was the end of a widely publicized um, uh, attempt at village democracy in China and it, it was seen all over the world but in particular China as well so some more conditions of discontent the increased availability of cell phones and the internet and domestic mobility through trains and buses has reduced the cost for collective action by the population and created venues for the development of a civil society. 71.8% of Chinese in 2022 have smartphones. 76.4% of urban population have access to the internet. Despite attempts by the CCP to suppress dissent, the need to maintain a sufficiently open economy to facilitate travel and business growth means that the state's course of apparatus is not that active in countering mobilization attempts compared with other developing countries. There's certainly a fair bit of uh, coercion, but you don't have a lot of violent uh, coercion. The higher the levels of education in the urban professional class may be a source of discontent if the levels of unemployment remain high. In 2013, and pretty constantly since, you've got at least 7 million graduates hitting the labor market. Now in China, compared uh, even to some countries in the European Union, the unemployment rate is not staggeringly high. So you have about 11% of youth unemployment uh, in 2020, up to about, uh, uh, yeah, about 12%. And the ur urban unemployment rate as well for that uh, category going up to the age of 24 is 18%. So you can expect a certain amount of dislocation. But uh, um, two things uh, here are key. One, uh, a significant portion of that younger population is shifting uh, from one job to the other. There's not a lot of loyalty in uh, many of the wealth in the business, practice, business hiring in many of the uh, uh, corporations along uh, the coast. And the second issue is that the youth are not that large of a population, so their discontent would be crowded out by the much larger cohort of the 25 to 35s or the 35s uh, to 55s. So growth in China, uh, starting from uh, 2015, slowed to about 7%, which may be sufficiently high to generate support for the regime. Now, it's since gone as low as 4%. This rate would need to drop substantially for an extended period of time for it to generate the mass mobilization of the population. Slow growth in export-oriented manufacturing would be sufficient to provide employment as there is a slow supply of blue-collar workers. But a much higher growth rate is required in the white-collar labor market to maintain stability to avoid unemployment. Now, income inequality is not a major issue in China. The Gini coefficient is actually fairly fair favorable. Uh, there are a few shanty towns uh, next to uh, gated communities in China, uh, as there are in the rest of the develop developing world. Most citizens seek more personal liberty, better governance, access to policymaking, and an end to high-level corruption. Low-level corruption in China is moderate to low, but there isn't a search for democracy. However, the new middle class will eventually have entitlement claims benchmarked to new higher standards of living, uh, which is an issue for the government. Now, most poor trust the state and are too weak to oppose it, particularly the rural population, which is very unlikely to demand democratization, except in the case of migrant workers who have at this point become old enough that they're really not, uh, not really uh, in, in a place to revolt. Blue collar workers tend only to revolt when one, their status falls below 
the equivalent to that of the poor, and two, they're not dependent on the state in the form of pensions and health care. Consequently, the workers of the state-owned enterprises are unlikely to be a source of pressure for democratization. The Communist Party has also dedicated considerable effort in positive, positively managing labor unions, providing health and subsidized housing benefits to the employees of the SOEs. Now, migrant workers are, uh, uh, they were considered an issue, but nothing ever emerged from them. There were about 70 million in 1993, up to 140 million in uh, uh, 2003. Uh, but then that population became uh, static. 65% of the migrants are intra-provincial. In other words, they're moving uh, not a great distance, just from the, the, the countryside into the outlying areas where the manufacturing is. 35% are intra-provincial, and they, they may suffer more dislocation. And at this point, 80% of them are between the ages of 35 and 55 years of age. There are, uh, of course, younger workers in the factories, but this is, this is the block of those migrant workers. And they never did politically mobilize. And so there's an established population in a number of cities. Uh, some of them have been excluded from benefits. Others have been granted um, the different benefits. And, have, and therefore, they're very unlikely to mobilize against uh, the Chinese state. So there are three paths for democratization. The first is structural democratization. Here, private entrepreneurs organize to overthrow the authoritarian regime, often with collaboration with the working class. Typically, the entrepreneurs are seeking to obtain political access in order to safeguard their property rights and to obtain representation in exchange for their being taxed. The most likely supporters of democratization are likely to be the middle class, consisting of small and medium business owners and white collar professionals. These business owners are most likely to get their finance capital from informal sources and not state banks. Uh, there was a, a, a big deal in the early um, uh, 2000s where people from Wenzhou and Zhejiang, who are famous as financiers in China, uh, uh, were targeted because of their aggregation of private finance, which the Chinese state sees as a serious threat to the point where they uh, put a young woman on trial and, and uh, essentially condemned her to death, although uh, there was a reprieve there. Democratization in China will not likely involve large capitalists or the managers of state-owned enterprises, both of which are dependent on state banks for capital and for the state to ensure social and economic stability. The working class, which is dependent on state-owned enterprises for employment, health care, and pensions, may also not support democratization. However, labor activism may support democratization non-strategically, not realizing that they will be worse off in the short term with the replacement of the authoritarian regime. The second path is voluntarist democratization. These are reform-oriented political elites, perhaps provincial bureaucrats, as in the case of the USSR, or individuals in the Chinese government or members of the Communist Party who join with those seeking democratization. During the June 4th incident, Deng Xiaoping represented the conservative forces against the reformers. Uh, you had, of course, Wang Deng in the streets. But within the Communist Party, you had Hu Yaobang and Zhao Jiang who genuinely thought China should become democratic. So know that there are those who, in the elite in China, are driven by Western ideas of constitutionalism and human rights. They simply don't have power. The third path is reform from above. The Communist Party gradually introduces democratic measures, both internally as a party for the selection of members of the government, and then municipal, provincial, and then central political positions. This path may be unlikely because of the rent-seeking opportunities afforded by an organization with almost 100 million members and with a dominating position over the national bureaucracy. This is the path that Hu Jintao undertook in his second term. Uh, that was in effect from about 2007 to 2012, which was then uh, completely reversed by Xi Jinping uh, by the beginning of his second term. It's conceivable that the reforms introduced by Hu Jintao to bring democracy within the Communist Party uh, could have eventually turned into a Communist China, but they were urban overturned by uh, Xi Jinping in his first and his second term.
So in 2009 and uh, 2010 in Shanghai, Hangzhou, and Chengdu, there were local nominations and elections for Communist Party officials, and in Nanjing there were elections for the leader and the deputy party leader. There was widespread lower-level democracy selectively across China, and then that's where we have here the um, election in Wukong village in Guangdong province in 2012, and, and the leader's arrest in 2016 uh, during uh, Xi Jinping's uh, first term when he cracked down on the use of democracy, both in the Communist Party and across the country. Uh, there were then, again, under Hu Jintao's second term, direct elections of local people's congresses in China at the township and county levels. Uh, China's villages were required to hold competitive elections uh, and started doing so as early as 1988 under some circumstances. Uh, normally, you're looking at about 2,000 voters, so it's a sort of a low-level democracy. But the point is, most of the Chinese population that's alive has uh, participated in this democracy. So they're familiar with the process. Higher level of elections of candidates uh, were done within the Communist Party. Now, when democratization does occur, it typically goes through two stages. Stage one, you have an initial transition where the authoritarian regime is overthrown, and stage two, consolidation, where democracy is negotiated by involved actors, including surviving elite members of the authoritarian regime. In other words, communism can, the Communist Party in China can never uh, be, be eliminated. All communist parties in the Warsaw Pact had, in some ways, transformed themselves, but continued to exist. China's transition to democracy will be smoother the higher the GDP per capita is when it happens. One prediction from a, uh, the Washington Quarterly uh, in 2012 said that uh, China would probably democratize in 2025 given current growth rates. Now those growth rates remained as predicted, but it's very unlikely China's going to democratize during Xi Jinping's third term. Now, the effects of democratization on China's foreign policy. The democratic peace theory argues that democracies never go to war against each other. Therefore, democratization should be associated with peace. However, young democracies tend to be dispute-prone over territorial issues with their neighbors, so China may be far less pacific after it democratizes than before. Uh, you can see here uh, various... Uh, uh, Japanese and Chinese demonstrations over the uh, Senkaku Islands. The Ch Chinese Communist Party has fostered nationalism with China since the June 4th incident, the Tiananmen Square Massacre. Before that, the high school textbooks and the children's textbooks didn't play up the Japanese invasion of China, largely because the communists uh, were not involved or were colluding to some extent with the Japanese. But after uh, Tiananmen, communism lost its strength as a source of motivation and regime legitimacy. So China fell back on nationalism. Now nationalism was always prevalent on some level and in order to deflect some criticism of the regime, it has obviously uh, been severely amplified. Now in part this has created a blowback, reducing the CCP's freedom of action. Especially over Taiwan, the Communist Party is tied to its propaganda that Taiwan belongs to China and no Beijing government could survive allowing Taiwan to become independent. And uh, Xi Jinping has made several speeches uh, that, uh, it, that have uh, uh, clearly indicated that he sees Taiwan coming back into the fold even if China has to use violence. The Communist Party's propaganda has linked China's rise to power to being able to retake Taiwan. For example, there are demands from the public that communist leaders uphold the national honor. There was much criticism of Chinese President Jiang Zemin for his weak response to the 1999 U.S. bombing of the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. On some issues, such as the Japan-China relations, the Chinese public is more confrontational than the communist leadership. The communist leadership has occasionally been compelled to adopt diplomatic positions more confrontational than is prudent by grassroots Chinese sentiment. Now, the impact of a democratic China. U.S. interests are to create a middle class in China through trade and thereby seed democracy, which would then become subject to the democratic peace theory. This then raises the question of whether a democratic China would not war on other democracies. 
Now, Taiwan has stated that any discussion for union with China depends on China democratizing. This could mean Taiwan leaving its alliance with the U.S. and Japan if China ever democratizes. But at that point, possibly China would not be seen as a threat. Democratization of China as a demonstration effect would uh, lead to severe regime legitimacy pressures in North Korea, Vietnam, and Laos, and likely the overthrow of communist governments there as well, in the same way that the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 led to the collapse of communism in Mongolia.